All right, well, uh, thank you all for, for joining us, and Shamik and Jane, uh, thank you for, for being here. Um, so, well, we only have 20 minutes, so let's just dive right into it, and I'd just like to ask both of you, what do you think are the top jobs of the future that AI will be most responsible for, that humans are doing right now? So, Shamik, maybe we can start with you. So you're talking about the jobs that will remain or the jobs that will go? That AI will be, res that, that AI is going to be doing, that humans are doing right now. Um, I think AI is going to take almost every job that we do today. Wow. Possibly with the exception of um, cr uh, purely creative and some very niche roles. That's not to say there won't be anything for humans to do, but I think it'll be a very different set of things to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Jane? Yeah, actually, if we try to put, put on a list, it will be way too long. <laughs> so I would say there are some very specific, specific criteria you can look at to see if this job is going to be uh, automated first. And these criteria are, first, do you have very specific KPIs to achieve in your work? Specific measurable KPIs. Second, uh, is the job repetitive in its routine decisions? Mm. Right? If you are making routine decisions to improve very specific KPI, you will be automated. This is it. You will be automated first. Maybe some others will come later, but these ones are already on the way of being replaced by AI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So given this reality that we're going to see you know, millions probably of jobs that are going to be made redundant by AI, what can employers, what can companies do to kind of prepare for this new reality? I mean, how should they be interacting with their current workforces to, men to you know, get them mentally ready for this? Um, so I think, uh, personally, I think the best thing to do is to be honest about it and, and, and be transparent. Also about the timeline, it's not happening tomorrow, it's going to take time. Uh, and to be quite positive about the roles that do lie ahead. Uh, personally, I think there's, there's two, three roles that, that will definitely continue. Uh, or, or even evolve. Uh, the first is that of an orchestrator, someone who brings all the parties together, who defines what the problem is to be solved, gets the experts involved, and basically makes it happen. The second is that of the designer. I don't just mean the U U UX design, but the entire human-centric design. How do you get, in, our, in my industry, how do you get a credit officer who's been making decisions on lending for 30 years using a particular methodology, how do you get that person first to agree that his pal will be fired, and then second, that he will do the job very differently. That's about human-centric design and so on. And the last role will be that of a policeman or a policewoman. Uh, how do you make sure that AI is doing what it's meant to be doing? How do you make sure that the data that was used to come up with the algorithm was correct, was complete? How do you make sure that the biases are removed? I think those three roles, together with the more creative role, uh, which is outside normal jobs, I think those will remain. And I think we need to think about how we reframe our organizations uh, along those directions. Mm -hmm. And Jane, in your, your role, kind of, you know, advising companies and helping them in the industrial space, I mean, what kind of advice do you give them when they're worried about, you know, interfacing with their current employees? You know, I have to tell, you know, X number of people that their jobs are going to be made redundant. I mean, what do you tell them? Well, actually, usually it's not us who solve this problem. <laughs> we create this problem, right? Because we bring them AI solution. Okay. So we basically are responsible for that. And there are other people who are solving this problem. Uh, but, uh, well, if we get serious, in fact, well, what I totally believe, first, I totally agree with my colleague. There are those roles and there are many more roles that will be uh, created in this new AI-powered world. Also, uh, in fact, right now, when we start deploying uh, AI-based solutions, probably the most important thing we as humans need to learn, and that's where we can use those experts we eventually will probably fire, but for now we need them to set the goals for the machine, to train the machine, to make sure to, to experiment with the results produced by AI solutions and making decisions on which ones to implement. So basically, uh, they need to a little bit upgrade from their current position, right? Becoming kind of a boss of their AI employee. Mm -hmm. Th that's that's right. the way you work with best of your experts. Yeah, I mean, we were discussing kind of, you know, what the uh, human machine interface will kind of be, um, how to get humans to actually interact with AI in a more productive way and you were discussing kind of able to you know, being able to interpret these black box um, predictions that AI make could you maybe discuss sort of what what that entails yeah that's actually quite a challenge because um, 
Well, there is a big discussion about AI transparency, AI explainability, and so on. Unfortunately, the, when we are trying to make AI to explain itself, that's totally the wrong way to, to handle this. Yeah, there are some attempts to do this. The problem is the very reason why AI is better than us humans in building those predictive models, in building recommendations, and all these kind of things, the very reason is that comparative to us, it can consider much more factors interacting with each other. So even if you make this AI to explain itself and answer the question, for example, why you decided not to issue a loan to this particular customer, the problem is the answer will look like a huge list, like thousands of factors with their relative weights. So you technically have your answer. Does it help you? No, you cannot process it. So the next step people are thinking about is, OK, let's teach machine how to simplify this, right? how to make it comprehensible for, for us humans. But the problem is, efficiently, it means that you teach machine to lie. right? Because you need to choose out of all those thousands of factors. You need, in fact, if we are thinking of KPI you are improving, you need to choose those which will be most comfortable for humans who are consuming it. So you're basically are teaching your machine to lie and be manipulative. Mm -hmm. Is this a good approach to the explainability and transparency? Probably not. Right. So in fact, the only efficient approach is, and it's also a very good approach in human management, is management by goals and results. Mm -hmm. That's what you do with AI, right? You need to trust it to experiment, measure results, and see if it works or not. Mm -hmm. And you would also emphasize really giving it explicit conditions, right? And you'd mentioned in, in one of our uh, chats before about you know its role in customer service and yeah. um, you know the problems that can arise there when when the you know your clients aren't really used to that's one of the biggest AI. problems for pretty much every company that starts their AI projects that's the mistake well at least with our customers I think 100 percent we had this situation so first time you put the goal for AI you will make mistakes because you need to be so much more explicit than you are used to, right? When you work with humans, humans have common sense. AI doesn't have common sense. It only will optimize <coughs> what you asked it to optimize within those restrictions you thought about. So if you forgot something, well, you will uh, receive the results you are not happy with. Yeah, we had this uh, good example with a guy in the customer service who was thinking about improving his customer service with AI. Um, and uh, he said, oh, it's exactly my situation, right? It's very clear. I have very specific KPI. It's how long the email thread is, how many answers we need to make to the customer to close the request. So the shorter, the better we are solving the customer's problem. Very clear. So can AI help me with that? I said yes. But the problem is you probably are forgetting something. You are not thinking about all the goals and all the restrictions. Because if you only put this criteria, yeah, you can reach it. But the problem is it may happen that the most optimal way to do that is to answer customers to piss them off so much they don't even continue dialogue, right? <laughs> they just leave you. If the criteria it is to be, get the shortest exactly. email thread, right? It will be very efficient in terms of your KPI. The problem is not for your business, the customer, right? right? But that's why when you work with humans, that's obvious. That's common sense, right? right. We don't, don't want, want to piss off, piss off our customer. customers. Right. Yes, but AI. Well, you need to be explicit. You need to measure it somehow. You need to put restrictions. You need to be very clear about your goals. Mm -hmm. And it's so unusual for us as humans to think this way that I think we'll need those human experts for quite some time to really learn and teach our organizations how to work with AI, how to put the goals, how to you know, think about all these kind of constraints. Mm -hmm. And so Shamik, I mean, do you agree kind of with this with this assessment that sort of the more the, the more clear inputs that you kind of put into the AI system up front and the more clear conditions that, that you give it, sort of the better the outputs will be and the more smooth the, the human AI interaction will be? Um, I agree with the concept because it's very difficult to agree and disagree that, you know, if you give a clear set. Uh, I think there are nuances on how this is applied. Um, both in the kind of industry you're in mm -hmm. and in the kind of company you are. So uh, let me explain the two things. If you are in an industry like banking, I mean, let's face it, uh, the most exciting thing about humans and also the most annoying thing about humans 
is that we like being irrational. We like doing stuff that for no reason. We take a liking to someone for no reason and we might take a dislike to someone for no reason. I'm not sure how well we can train AI, at least as it stands today, in those kind of industries. So that's one angle. The other angle is about what kind of a corporation is it or an organization is it? Is it a large incumbent bank like ours, 150 years old, or, or many other organizations which are 100 plus years old? Or is it uh, a relatively new technology-driven organization? My sense is that the large organizations, their durability and their uh, uh, future depends on how well the humans embrace AI. Mm. The new organizations, their future depends on how well the AI embraces humans. And I think they're very different perspectives. I don't believe they're the same. Mm -hmm. I think you need mm -hmm. to come at it from different ways. Interesting. Yeah, may I add to that? I actually I totally second to this. Uh, I even think that, in fact, these are two different perspectives, but they need to go together. Yeah. So we had this uh, very interesting example when we implemented an AI solution for metallurgy company. Right? They are making steel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically, what, what can you do there with AI, yeah. right? But the thing is that when you make steel, you start with a scrap metal of unknown composition. So it's huge uncertainty. And then during the melting, you need to make decisions on how much of uh, expensive additives, called ferroalloys, to put there to reach the necessary quality of steel. Okay. Right? And if you have better predictive model, which AI can do, you can save on those ferroalloys. Yeah. Obviously, if you can just know better how much to put there. You will not need to put some spare fer ferroalloys just to stay on the safe side, mm -hmm. right? Because of more precise model. So you're saving money, quite a lot of money. But here's the problem. Currently, they have operators, experienced metallurgists, who are making this decision. At which moment, how much ferroalloy is put into the mixture. So now, when we are bringing this AI solution, what happens is that those metallurgists, they, when they are making their decisions, they are looking at like phys physical or material science-based models and some current uh, data from, from the process itself. And now they also have recipe provided by our AI machine. Recipe which says, OK, optimal solution is actually this one. Mm. Now, here the problem comes. Operators are not happy ac accepting these recipes. And the reason is that in many cases, the recipes look unfamiliar. They look weird mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Again, just as I said, the very reason why AI can be more precise is that it considers more factors, mm -hmm. right? And the very reason we can improve what these operators are doing is that we can be, well, we can recommend something they will not do, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. if right. we recommend the same solution, the operators already know, there will be no improvement. Right. So the very reason why we can improve it now is a barrier to adoption. Right. But so how do you solve it? Because they look at it and say, no, I'm, I'm just not doing this, right? I'm an expert. I look at this. It looks crazy. Not right. how it works. I'm right. not doing this. Right. So you tackle it from both ways. Right. It's, it's a really good example right. because you tackle it from both ways. On one hand, from AI side, what we did, we basically built a second algorithm, second predictive model. So first one builds the optimal recipe, like mm -hmm. list of like top three optimal recipes, top five optimal recipes. And the second one evaluates the probability of this recipe being accepted by operator. Mm, interesting. Right? And you basically choose the one which probably is not the most optimal but it will be accepted. Interesting, interesting. So that's what you can do from the algorithmic side. Right. On the other hand, from human side, you can also do things. What we did, uh, we asked operators to do two things. First, if they like the recipe provided by AI, they could push, uh, they had this button, like. They could put like on that. Mm. It didn't do anything, this like. That kind of helped the AI sort of refine itself? Theoretically, it way, could. Or? In fact, we didn't even use it. Uh -huh. But just the fact they could kind of evaluate and you know, use their expertise to say, yeah, I like this one, mm -hmm. already raised the acceptance rate for recipes. Mm. Just the fact they could you know, push like. Right. And the second thing that also works great was when they are not accepting the recipe, they were asked to give a brief explanation why. And again, we didn't even do anything yet mm -hmm. with those explanations. Mm -hmm. Just the fact they need to stop and think about it and put it into some words 
raise, like, sorry, percent acceptance rate. Interesting, interesting. So what you do, you basically work with both sides, right? right. You teach AI how to be more acceptable by humans, and right. you teach humans how to treat AI more fairly, right, right, right? For what it really does. Right. I guess it, we only have you know about two minutes left, so I just kind of wanted to ask, you know, how can AI sort of be better trained? I guess is maybe maybe the right way to put it to accept human irrationality, right? These kinds of things you're talking about, you know, humans not necessarily thinking in the most logical progression possible. Yeah. So so I think um, this is half in knowledge and half in hope. Um, I think the knowledge part, we've seen exactly the same thing in credit um, assessments uh, by forcing people uh, to say which ones worked, which ones didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually do use it to decide the acceptability because it also depends on what you're doing. When you're doing metallurgy in a factory, I mean, it's going to produce steel. That's mm -hmm. pretty objective. When you're trying to lend to somebody, there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, you mm. don't know for sure this guy will be a bad loan. Right. So actually, the subjectivity it's a matter of anyway. Probabilities. Yeah. So yeah. I think we actually do include the likes and the dislikes and so on. Interesting. But the part that I said in hope is that I actually think, and I hope, for the sake of my two kids, if not anybody else, that actually there will be a role for the human being, even mm. in the future. That I don't mm -hmm. think we will always have. AI taking on every right. aspect. We're going to have it be completely able to 100%. Yeah. Well, as I said, half in knowledge, half take in Take all of our, <laughs> all of our jobs away. Yes. <laughs> have a panel up on stage. Yes. <laughs> Just a bunch of smart machines. Yeah. Right. Okay. And and sort of your view of sort of AI and irrationality. I mean, do you think that's something that AI will be able to to handle in the future? Human irrationality. Well, as I said, we'll just teach both sides to work with each other. As long as there's more inputs, kind of, like, that's, that's yeah, the most important uh, thing. Yeah, in fact, there is no other way around it. Right. Because AI brings so much more efficiency, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you don't have a choice. Right, right, right. right. You don't really have a choice. You right. either embrace it or you're done. Right. So you really need to learn how to deal with it. Interesting, interesting. Well, thank you very much. I think we're just about out of time. It was a really interest, interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.